looking forward to this morning's message. Uh, after a week off, it's always great to be back in church and doing worship. And uh, our time this morning in the Word of the Lord, I just feel like it's a, a timely word. Take out your teaching sheets this morning as we look into a message simply entitled, Let Go and Let God. As you all know, this past week, uh, my wife and I uh, had joy uh, an opportunity to spend a week with our uh, oldest son Nathan and his wife Alicia in, in Honolulu, Hawaii. They have a beautiful home there and they invited us out so uh, we made arrangements. Uh, thank you to Adrian Rodriguez last week for speaking. I appreciate that and um, we were able to unplug for a week and we just had a, had a wonderful time. It was Joanne's birthday so we we celebrated um, that. Uh, we slept uh, eight, nine hours <laughs> uninterrupted. That was nice. Uh, went out to the restaurants a few times and ate. That was fun. And we golfed for three days. That was also a blast. So thank you for allowing us to get away. And um, in, in light of that, uh, when we got to um, Nate and Alicia's place, Alicia had put together um, <coughs> One of those welcome baskets that you might find at a five-star resort where they, they lay out uh, a bunch of uh, gifts for you. Um, uh, you know, things that smell nice and things to make you comfortable. And, and her extra added gift was a couple of coffee cups. Joanne had just turned 64, so she had a Beatles mug for Joanne. Anybody know why? Beatles on their Sergeant Pepper Lonely Hearts Club Band. They had a hit song called Will You Still Love Me When I'm 64? <laughs> if you remember that, Joanne turned 64, and, and that's been a, a, an icon of a song for years. She turned 64, and she got that, that mug. But um, um, I just want to let you know, um, I still need her and I will still feed her now that she's 64 as a lyric. So I got a cup and I brought it this morning. I wanted you to see this. It's an awesome cup. It says, let go and let God on both sides of the cup. Let go and let God. And here on the inside part, there's a verse. And it simply is from Joshua 1, 9, which is this morning's message, be strong and courageous. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So I'm going to refer to this cup a couple of times this morning, let go and let God. And after she gave that to me, and uh, through the, the week we had discussions about life, uh, the busyness of life, the circumstances of life, um, professions and work and relationships and we talked all about that and I was so encouraged because each time I thought about that I was reminded that I need to let go and let God let God handle it and that's what I uh, decided to talk about this morning in Bible college in 1975 when I got to San Diego one of uh, my first classes was Old Testament survey. And as I began to know about the Bible and review the Old Testament in this one particular class, we came upon the book of Joshua and it just became alive in my heart. And this morning I want to, to read the first nine verses out of Joshua 1.9 and then bring us some points that I think are going to be very helpful. Um, the, the verses are there on your handout, so let's go ahead and read this, um, read these verses, and then I'd like to make these, these, these comments. Again, we're going to talk about letting go and letting God. So, um, the scriptures record here in Joshua 1.9, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. 
Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Wow, what a great promise. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave nor forsake you. Verse 6, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give to them. Be strong, once again, verse 7, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep the book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? And once again, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. I'd like to just remind everyone that this truth that we just read, that we just heard, is timeless. To be strong and to be courageous and not to be afraid, not to be discouraged, knowing that the Lord is going to be with you wherever you go knowing that the Lord is going to be with you in every circumstance that you face, whether it's a relationship circumstance or a profession or a job circumstance, a financial circumstance where it might be tied. Wherever you go and whatever you do, the Lord will be with you. That is the promise. Uh, I, I love this. And... Um, you know, maybe you learned that like I did when you first started walking with the Lord way back in the late 70s. And I grabbed a hold of that. It's been my foundational platform for all of these years. Or maybe later on in your relationship with the Lord, you, you got a hold of that. Or perhaps this morning. Uh, I know most of you, it wouldn't be true this morning, but maybe someone watching online um, or catch this video, Maybe you're just now coming to the realization that this is something I need to get a hold of. Wherever you are, you want to make sure that this is uh, understood in your own spirits and in your walking and living in this truth. So this morning, I'd like to take our time and talk about three, what I call three points, to remind us of the truth of God and how we can rely on this truth. God's word, this is God's promise, and we can rely on it. So, there's some fill in the blanks here this morning. Follow along with me. Fill in the blanks, a number of real great scriptures that I'd like to read this morning, and then uh, make a couple of points. So, number one, what's unknown to me is known to God. Write down those two words on your handouts. What's unknown to me is known to God. The children of Israel didn't know everything about the journey that they were on. They had been uh, uh, released from captivity. They wandered for quite a while, but now they're ready to actually get into the promised land. That's where we find them. And they're not real sure how it's going to play it out. The Lord said, this land is yours. But um, they knew they, they had to go in and do a little fighting. Was the Lord going to be with them? He was going to show up. Um, Bottom line is Joshua said, we can do this. So they rallied around and said, hey, let's go. Let's do this. Let's go cross the river and let's get into the promised land. And that's like our lives today. So many areas, as I mentioned, not really sure what's going to happen, but we need to just say, let's go.
go. Let's believe that God will help us in those circumstances, in those situations, uh, in our relationships, in our marriages, in our uh, 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 professions, all the drama that we face daily. Um, we don't know it all, but God does. So, um, what do we do? Let go and let God. That's the theme this morning. And uh, I want to do that more in my life. I want you to do that more in your life. I like this verse here out of Hebrews 4.15. God sees everything. He knows everything. And just because I don't see it or you don't see it doesn't mean it's not true or it doesn't mean that there's a lessening of the truth uh, or it doesn't mean because I can't see that it's not reliable. That's not the case at all. What's Hebrews say? God sees and knows all. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. I do love that. He sees it all. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And there's nothing that God does not see and that God does not know. I love the songs that we sang this morning because it describes a lot of the beauty of God and how he's aware of everything. How about this verse out of Psalms 139 and 16, you know, in the era of our pro-life issues here in the United States. It's, it's coming to a head after all these years. And this is a good thing. It's a, this is a good thing that we can say, you know what? Every uh, person, uh, whether born or unborn, is precious in God's sight. And I love this. Um, I love this verse because it talks about that God knows everything about each individual. Your eyes saw my unborn body all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Isn't that a beautiful verse? God has knew everything about you, everything about me, every individual that's ever been created. God knows about. He saw my unborn body. Jeremiah 29, 11. This verse needs to be on one of these coffee cups or a, a calendar hanging on my wall or, in my case, spray painted to the, to the freezer section because <laughs> I'm always going for ice cream. <laughs> I need this verse right there on the left-hand side of the refrigerator where I'm opening the door for ice cream. I want it to, I want to be able to read like we know this verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. How does God do that? It's because he knows everything about us. There is nothing unknown about us. And the plans that he's laid out for us, they're great. I like this verse out of uh, Deuteronomy 31, um, verse 8. It's the same uh, accounting of what we just read in Joshua, but in Deuteronomy, the, the words change just a little bit. They're ready to cross over the Jordan and take the land, um, but look at the, notice the extra emphasis. Do not be afraid or discouraged, but check it out. It says, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. Personally. He's going to take the time to go ahead of your drama, your situation, your circumstance, whatever you need. He personally goes ahead of you, just like he did with the children going into the promised land. He led them. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Some of us have experienced what it's like to have someone fail us. Or even worse yet, abandon us. Not a good thing. The Lord won't do that. So I love this verse 20. What's unknown to me is known to God. Let's go on to number two of three simple reminders this morning. What may be hard or impossible for me is easy for 
and possible with God. Right in those uh, four words, what may be hard or impossible for me is uh, what may be hard or impossible for me is easy for and possible with God. I've been around a long time. I'm 60, um, 65. There's a few others here in the congregation who are now older than me. Certainly the ladies that left our earth last year, Maria, 101, and Edna, just shy of 100, and Carrie, we miss them dearly. They could even speak to this point is that they served God for so many years. But I've been around a long time. And I've come to the realization that life, in fact, is hard. It's hard. It's difficult. Jesus said, hey, it's okay. You're going to have a hard time, a difficult time, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And it's this concept that helps us soldier on, continue on. But the fact is that life is hard. And it's made even more difficult when we do not look to the Lord for his strength. When we do not look to the Lord for his direction. Uh, and it's made harder when we don't rely on him for his strength. And we rely on our own. Before we know it, we're, uh, we're out of gas. So... Um, I have this great analogy I'd like to, to think to you. I said on our vacation, we got to go golfing for three days. My wife's taking up golf. I got her some golf clubs last year. I love to golf for years. We get to golf whenever we have a chance. My son Nathan golfs, and we got Alicia to get a, a, a golf lesson and, and a set of clubs. And the four of us went golfing. I love golfing. And I love this analogy of hitting a golf ball. Um, there is a one, there is a many, many, many hundreds, if not thousands, of things that you need to comprehend of how to improve. You can never do it. That's why the professional golfers are spending hours and hours and hours working on their golf game. It can never be perfected. But there is one thought that is paramount in, in my view, and it is the exact moment that precedes when you make the effort to hit the golf ball. If you notice somebody's swinging, getting ready to hit the golf ball, they take a lot of time. They don't just stand up and boom. It's not like hitting shallows of basketball. There's a, there's a positioning, there's a setup, uh, there's a focus, there's a, there's a process. There's all this stuff going through one's mind but it's at the moment before the swing actually starts that's paramount, it's so important. And I, I call that moment, um, it's called the strike, when you hit a ball, when you strike it. That moment, there needs to be total focus on what you're doing, and if there isn't, there's so much that can go wrong. The ball, um, uh, if you're thinking about one of the many uh, lessons you can't focus uh, it's not second nature to you now you're overthinking it and you get you get tense you get tight you can't freely swing the club and it's that one very moment that you focus on what you are doing and um, I like this because in our life there's so many distractions around us any one of those scenarios I talked about, whether it's a situation with a relationship, a husband, a wife, a child, a grandchild, a co-worker, a, a, our relationships. Um, if it's a situation, um, well, finances is a big deal. Your finances are upside down and you're trying to make it work and I mean, today we have all this inflation and X amount coming in, X amount going out. And, and there's, there's drama, it seems like, in our economy. And uh, we're trying to figure it out. So it's our relationships and it's our professions and it's our working for the, the 
For years, I called him our, our stinky superintendent. For years, I had to work for a guy that didn't like me. He did not like me, and he made my life difficult. And I had to every morning get up and just say, God, you got to help me today. And I went to work, and I, 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 was, I was ready in the strength of the Lord, and I got through, I got through my day. And pretty soon, um, well, it didn't happen overnight, but by the time I left that company, it was okay. I found something that I liked about him, and I focused on that. So it's our professional lives, our jobs, that situation. What we have to do is really take those distractions and set them aside. Um, we need to focus on the Lord. We must focus on the promises of the Lord, the, the, um, the goodness of God. That's what we're talking about. So with our hard or impossible situations, um, for us, it's easy and possible with God. I like these four bullet points I've give, given us here. The first bullet point, with God, nothing is too hard. Too hard. We, I, I, I get that when I think about all the things in my life. Man, this is hard. Well, you know what? Life, once again, is hard. Life is difficult. Um, I, like, I love that one song that we sang about uh, creation and how it, it uh, worships God. And if, if creation worships God, <laughs> we should be worshiping God. I like this, uh, this analogy, uh, not even an analogy, but if you've ever taken time to, uh, to stop and gaze up into the evening or the night sky and you see all of the, uh, the planets and all the stars and the galaxies, and, and um, you know, God put all that in place. Um, do you think, with his ability to set all the beauty in the heavens in place, do you think that your, your situation, I want to say your little situation, but to you it's not little. Do you think your situation, your drama, your circumstance is too hard for God? Put it in perspective. I don't think so. I, 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 he's the one that set the galaxies in place. I don't think my little bit of drama is too hard for him. Um, have you ever walked along the seashore and you see how beautiful it is? The song talks about how the, the waves declare his glory. While we were in Honolulu one afternoon, we took a walk down to the ocean and, and um, the seashores on most of the islands, uh, the Hawaiian islands, are, uh, they're not all sandy seashores. A lot of it is, is hard, rocky, volcanic rock that was, from years ago, when the islands were formed, the, the lava would come down and just fall into the ocean. And when lava dries, that volcanic rock is sharp, hard and we had a chance to walk along this one area and I found it amazing how uh, how a how beautiful it was but I thought about the greatness of God of the the lands that we live on and how at God's command the waters just don't continue to rain and flood the world again he promised that would never happen after the flood. But he commands the waves up to this point and no more. And I, th I thought about not only the galaxies in the sky, but that scenario. One of the days when we went golfing, it was at a golf course that reminded me of the movie Jurassic Park. Not that there were dinosaurs chasing me. There was a, there was a time when three little pigs chased us, but the, that's, a, that's a, another story for a different time. There were no dinosaurs on this particular golf course, but there were hundreds of thousands of beautiful sounding birds. And I thought about the beauty of nature, that God could get these birds to sing and communicate and talk. We don't understand their chirping, but if you've been in and out for you all the chick -a -chick -a -chick, all that chirping, God and his awesomeness created nature. Do you think that he would turn his back on you? Or worse than that, he can't handle your circumstance? 
your situation, I have to believe that there is nothing too hard for him. I love these two verses out of Jeremiah. Verse 32, 17, Ah, sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Beautiful verse. And then 10 verses later, same chapter, same book, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is there anything too hard for me? <laughs> he even states that. So good. Second bullet point, with God, nothing is impossible. Years ago, there was the old chorus, nothing is impossible. If you've been around a long time, you probably remember that chorus. Nothing is impossible for God. I like that. I like the definition of impossible. Are you ready for this? It's not on your notes, but this is profound. This is so good. The definition of impossible. Uh, not able to occur, comma, exist, comma, or be done. Not able, once again, to occur, exist, or be done. That's the, that's, that's, uh, that's the definition of impossible. This is the part that just is so eye-opening. It's from Middle English, whatever that is. Doc Meacham isn't here this morning. I don't know what Middle English is, but then it went uh, at, from Middle English, and that was from the Latin, and here's the meaning. <laughs> its meaning is simply not, quote-unquote, not. Not possible. Nothing is impossible, or nothing is not possible. I so love that. Tongue-in-cheek there. It's not that deep, but nothing is is impossible or not possible with God. So often we find ourselves in the middle of our situations, and I use the word stymied. We're stymied. We're kind of frozen. We don't know which way to go, to the right, to the left, because there's there's a, there's a situation in front of us. Uh, the facts are circling our head. We're trying to grasp what's going on. Uh, we've listened to the facts. We've identified them, but we can't really get a handle on all of the facts. Take for uh, an argument, for example, in a, um, in a relationship, a heated argument. Uh, everyone's got a viewpoint, and everyone... Uh, rightfully has a viewpoint, and this is my point of view, and, 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 and there's emotions behind that, and before you know it, it's just, it's just this crazy argument going on. We've experienced that. We know what that's like. I like that, uh, that idea that, hey, anytime you're in an argument, take a, take a breather, oh, 15 seconds, 15 minutes sometimes. <laughs> Give it, just let cooler heads prevail. Slow down, stop, let's think about it. Put a a cap on that. And I, I, I like that because it, then if we do that, it helps us to kind of understand that I don't like uh, being in a place where I'm, I'm just kind of frozen and I'm stymied. Once again, when you're in those kind of situations, just let, let it go. Let go and let God. That's why I love this theme. Um, I like the example um, that we find in Luke 1. I'll tell you, I'm, I can't read all the verses. There's just so much, but um, Luke 1 records the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus, um, encountering an angel, and the angel comes to her and says, um, you are highly favored. The Lord's with you. You're going to have a son, and uh, he's going to be called the, uh, the son of the Most High. Listening to this, you know the story, and uh, uh, the, his kingdom—it's never going to end. And she can't wrap her her head around this, and she says, "Bottom line, hey, how's this going to happen? I'm a virgin, dude." She didn't say, "I'm a virgin, dude," to the angel, but she says, "I'm a virgin. I can't. I can't even understand what you're talking about. How is this going to happen?" And the angel says, "It's the." The Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High God will overshadow you. And then the angel says, even Elizabeth, your aunt, she's going to have a child. Remember that? 
part of her story. They knew her best, John the Baptist. And she was older. The Bible talks about how she was older. And yet she even was going to have a son. And the angel told her all of this. And um, uh, this is what Jesus, this is what the angel said. For no word from God will ever fail. So what a great example of this, that, that uh, with God nothing is impossible. Luke 137, for no word from God will ever fail. Grab a hold of that one. Put that on the inside bottom of the co coffee cup or spray paint that to your freezer. I like that. For no word from God would ever fail. I like the story out of Matthew 17. I'll just tell the story and read the verse. And the story is when Jesus healed the de demon-possessed boy. Um, when uh, they came to a crowd, a man approached Jesus and he, he, he kneels down before the Lord. He says, have mercy on my son. Uh, he has seizures. He's suffering greatly. He's in real bad shape. And sometimes he throws himself into the water. Sometimes he throws himself into the fire. Uh, and but Jesus, I brought him to your disciples. Not going to happen. <laughs> they couldn't get the job done. That must have been a little that's hard for him to admit that. And the disciples were standing there listening. So um, Jesus turns to the disciples. And this is what he says. He says, you unbelieving and perverse generation. Wow. <laughs> How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Oh, my God. You were a disciple right there. You kind of want to slink away into the background. Jesus is really reading you the light. Uh, the right act. So Jesus says, bring the boy to me. And he brings the boy. Jesus rebuked the demon and came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. Um, Matthew 17 again in verse 19. Then the disciples came to Jesus and cried with him out. Why couldn't we drive it out? This is what he, he said in verse 20. It's there on your handout. Jesus he replied, because you have so little faith. And why, that's why they couldn't drive it out. Little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Wow. With God, nothing is impossible. For us, if we have a little bit of faith, we now can grab hold of this fact. In our circumstances, in our situations, in our drama, in our pressure-filled lives, we can believe that God can move on our behalf. I so love this verse. Matthew 17 and verse 20. How about the rich and the kingdom of God getting into the kingdom of God? We find that story in Matthew 19. We know the story. It, uh, man came to Jesus and said, hey, how do I get eternal life? What's the secret? How can I have eternal life? And um, are you good? Keep the good commandments? Yeah, I do that. I, I keep the commandments. And Jesus even said, which ones? He said, I, I, I don't murder. I don't commit adultery. I don't steal. I don't give false testimony. I honor my father and my mother. I, I kept all of these. What do I still lack? And Jesus said this, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions, give to the poor, and then you'll have treasures in, in heaven. And then come and follow me. Are you kidding me? I got to do that too? I got to give away? And the guy went away sad because that is hard to do. Working hard day and night, and now he's got everything he has. Jesus says, give it away. Then you can come follow me. Then you can make it into the kingdom. Uh, just really, really hard. He heard that he went away sad. Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And then here in verse 25 and 26, and when the disciples heard Jesus talking, they were greatly astonished. He asked, then who can be saved? I would ask the same question. Who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And we know that's true. Because what God did for us as humanity, 
He sent Jesus to die on the cross that we could be made right in the sight of God and now we have access into eternity. That's what this man was looking for. With you and I, it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Jesus looked at this and said, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Matthew 19, 26, 39. I got Paul even instructs in Philippians 4, 13, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I so love this uh, concept. This uh, next bullet point, God has given us promises that we should regularly recall. Write those um, three words down. God has given us promises that we should regularly re recall. I so enjoy my daughter and all. We prayed that all of our children would have great spouses, and our son Nathan uh, married Denise a few years ago. Such a such a woman of God. We've met her. She's been here. She was here last December. She loves God. She loves the Word of God. And um, everywhere we went, every morning we, we got up and we went somewhere where it was golfing or the ocean, she would say, hey, everyone, do you want to hear my devotion for this morning? We'd all say, yeah, let's hear it. And she would read the devotion of the day. And it always had a, a great point and a great verse and just really boosted us up. It's the, it's the, those little devotions that make us realize, you know what? It's the promises of God that are going to sustain us. It's the promises of God that we are going to convince us. We need to look at them regularly. I love uh, Romans 8, 38 and 39, for I am convinced. The promises of God convince us. I heard Romans say, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth or anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're so filled with his promises that we become convinced, moved, unshaken. He's on our side. He's working on our behalf. Nothing will remove us from what? The love of God. So very important. And this next bullet point is we're getting ready to leave. The second point is we're, uh, we're promised that we'll never face a test that we can't handle. Four fill in the blanks. We're promised that we'll never, never, never we promise that we'll never face a test that we can't handle. How freeing is that? We all have difficulties in our life, pressures, situations, circumstances, but it, it's everything is something that we can, in fact, handle. We're not going to drown. I so like this. I like this because everything that you're going through is not uncommon to others. Others have been there. They've been there, done that. Sometimes you think, am I the only one going through this? This is hard for me. No, everyone else has been there and done that. The longer you live, the more you encounter, the more you experience, the more you go through, the more confidence and faith you can gain. So there's a byproduct, a good thing of going through <laughs> difficult times because of the confidence and faith that it gives you. I believe that, that is refreshing. At least to me, it's refreshing. Um, there's, there is a way out. And we just hang on and then watch. No matter what comes, we see the way out. I love 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. I mentioned that. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. I like that word, tempted. Uh, it can be translated also, he will not allow you to be tested beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can endure. So once again, we're promised that we'll never face a test that we can't handle. Let's go on to number three as we begin to wind this, um, 
this idea of we go let go and let God recalling God's faithfulness in the past gives me courage and confidence to face the future a lot there to take in recalling bring to remembrance write that down recalling God's faithfulness when in the past what you've experienced Remembering what God has done for you in the past, it does what? It produces, it gives me courage. It gives you courage and confidence to do what? To face today and what's going to happen tomorrow, the future. Um, when you read through the book of Joshua, you, you can see the faithfulness of God in action. The, the first chapter of Joshua, and we read those verses, it records how um, God promised them that he was going to give them the land. Now you guys just got to cross the river and go get it. I promised it to you. All you got to do is obey him. Um, the story is interesting in that after God promised them uh, the land, they now got to go get it. Joshua sends a couple, you remember the story, sends a couple of spies into the first city that they're going to take. The city was Jericho. We know the story. Find it there in the first, second chapter of, of Joshua. Sends a couple of spies into Jericho, and they're spying out the land, but there was someone there that worked on behalf of God and hid the spies. The Bible says she was a prostitute. Her name was Rahab. It's a wonderful story. If you carry her story all the way through, her lineage actually is in the lineage of just an amazing story. The couple of spies shows up. She hides them. They get the lay of the land. Then she sends them in a different direction. They go back. They report. To Joshua, you know, we can do this, but God has a different plan for Joshua and the army of Israel. He says, here's my plan. You guys go and you march around the city, six days in a row, with just the, the, the Levites, the singers, the band. Get out there and sing some praise choruses. Don't lift the sword. Don't do anything. And I can only imagine that the guys, you know, the captains of the army says, are you kidding me? They probably didn't voice it, but they're thinking, are you kidding me? I don't get to swing, swing my sword. I got to take them down to the city. I don't get to kill anybody. They didn't say anything. They were obedient to Joshua. They were obedient to the word of the Lord six days around. But on the seventh day, watch, we do a miracle. Blow the trumpet. And when they did that on the seventh day, the walls, we know the story, the kids reenact it. We have songs about it. The walls came tumbling down, and God gave them the victory over that first city, Jericho. They didn't have to do anything. All they had to do, interestingly enough, they had to do one thing. They had to go get the plunder, all the riches, and give it to God. Don't keep any of it yourself. That was the, what they had to do. But we see a, 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 a great miracle happening. Um, I, I love this story. I, I love the story about Rahab, too. She, she was filled with such faith that the Bible in the New Testament, mentions her two times. They're the heroes of faith. In, in the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, talks about all the heroes of faith. She's mentioned right there. And also, in the book of James, James, the writer of James, talked about um, uh, faith without works is dead. She could have believed that she could help God, but she did something about it. She hid the spies. She's mentioned twice. So, uh, once again, a great story. But, um, this whole, this whole taking uh, the city of Jericho, watching God help them take the city, was wonderful. I mentioned just a moment ago that God said, okay, um, you guys don't take any of the plunder. If you recall, if you, if you know the story, there was a guy by the name of Achan. Uh, as they're going through and cleaning up the city, taking the plunder is all supposed to be put in the treasury. But Achan, in his left pocket, he had uh, a couple of pieces of gold, and in his right, a couple pieces of silver. And he also took a, a robe from Babylon, beautiful colored robe. And he took those things back to his tent, took up some 
bottom of the tent and you dug a hole and you put this big buoy inside the hole, cover it up. Think of all the spirit. It's an amazing story of how disobedience caused them and their family to die. How so? Because the second city after Jericho was a city called Ai. A I. Ai. Ai. And uh, some guys around said, yeah, it's just a few people there. Just bring a couple hundred men. It'll be fine. They went up and they got slaughtered. They came back. What is going on? I thought God gave us this land. Joshua inquires of the Lord and says, hey, there's a problem here. If someone has sinned, it's been sent in the camp. There's disobedience. And the story goes to say that Achan was named as the guy that stole from what was to belong to the Lord to keep to himself. Long story short, they had to come out before the, the people, him and his kids, his wife, his kids, maybe his even his sisters, don't know, but they got stoned. horrible way to die. But it was his decision that caused men to die trying to take that city. They had to consecrate themselves. They had to ask for forgiveness. As I was studying this out, I was even talking to Joanne about this. I wonder, is, is there something that we through our decisions that we might be in disobedience to God that not only affects us, but our kids and our grandkids and those around us. I mean, all of the people of Israel were affected. They lost a battle that day because of this guy's sin. Lord, help us. Help us to check ourselves. Are, are we being obedient? And if not, let's be obedient. I, I'd hate to see me do something that would cause my wife or my kids daughter-in-laws and my son-in-law and their children to be taken out in front of some place and, and be killed because of my disobedience. Thank God for forgiveness and, and, and now we live under grace because I mean, we were talking about this. Is it the same today? Well, Joanne reminded me that we live under grace nowadays, but boy, you don't want to mess. You don't want to mess with that. Be obedient. Anyways, they continued to serve God. They moved on, and eventually God gave Joshua insight on how to take Ai. They set an ambush. It's a great read, great story. They're in Joshua 7 and chapter 8, and they continue to move on. And what it did is produce a confidence for them to go year after year, town after town, taking the land, a great miracle of confidence. Once again, Joshua 21, verses 43 through 45. So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to their ancestors, and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them the rest, gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their ancestors. Not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord gave all their enemies into their hand. Not one of the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. Isn't that great? What confidence. <laughs> I, I so love it. Let me tell a quick story. I, I, I'm probably going to go a little longer than I, I usually do, but such a great story. The other day, a couple weeks ago, I bought this can of Costco. I love shopping at the Costco. Why? Because of the return policy. I bought this floor fan, went home and set it up, got it out of the box. And as I was putting, um, Carl, you'll appreciate this, I put in the fan on I put the fan on backwards. I didn't know that was pretty easy to do. I just put it on backwards. Then I couldn't. I realized, oh, this is backwards. This thing's going to work. And I couldn't get it off. I tried. I tried. Unless I destroyed the thing, I could not get this fan off. So, you know what I do? I just put it back in the box. Leave it in the back of the Jeep. Drove down to Costco. And I sheepishly, and yet with total confidence, went in where they have returns. And I walk up to the counter. And in my car, there's this box with a kind of sort of constructed band. It was obviously something wrong. But it was like, oh, it's probably. I don't know. I was something wrong with this thing. And I, huh. She said, you don't know what's wrong? I said, well, I'm, I'm not real sure. But it's 
not working. I'm not totally sure. I wasn't lying. It's not working. She told me. You want cash or you want store credit? I said, oh, give me a, give me store credit. She gave me this little card and I went out my merry way and went in and another door. And you know where I went? <laughs> I went to where the stands were on sale. They were on sale. Grabbed it, put it in the cart, went through the self-checkout, went to pay, gave the card that she had given to me. I got a new pen, went home, put it together. Problem solved. Why did, why did, why did, why do I use that example? It's because the confidence that I have in what? The store policy. You got a problem? Bring it back to Costco. I will be a Costco shopper for that very reason. I'm going to serve God for that very reason. I have confidence that he is going to help me through. Psalms 37, 25. I was young and now I'm old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. And in Psalms 77, 11, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. Talked about being older. These, as you serve God, these are the verses that mean so much. You can count on them. It has produces confidence in you. It's recall, recalling God's faithfulness in the past. It gives me courage and confidence to fa face the future in this verse that we all love and all know. Hebrews 13 and verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. What did I say this morning? Well, what's unknown to me is known to God. Let go and let God. Right here. Let go and let God. Why? Because what's unknown to me is known to God. Let go and let God. How do we do that? Well, what may be hard or impossible for me is easy for and possible with God. Let go and let God. Well, how do we do that? Well, we do that by recalling God's faithfulness in the past because it gives me courage and confidence to face the future. Lord, we pray that as we leave this place, we will be able to do just this, to let go and let God to release our circumstances, our situations to you, our, our relationship dramas, everything that seems to weigh us down. We pray that you would help us to let go and let you. We pray that what we heard this morning would be beneficial to us as we take on this week. And we thank you for it. We pray a blessing upon everyone that's heard this and will hear this throughout the week. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. All right, well, God bless you. Have a wonderful day, and we will see you next time.